Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's webinar on our Part 2 of MS Symptoms, uh, focusing on mood and cognition issues. My name is Ann Lee Gilbert, and I'm the Senior Specialist of Programs and Online Education here at Can Do Multiple Sclerosis, and I'm happy to be your moderator this evening. If you're not already familiar with who we are and what we do, Can Do MS provides lifestyle empowerment programs for people living with MS and their support partners. And through our programs, uh, we help to empower people to move beyond their MS by giving them knowledge, skills, tools, and confidence to adopt healthy lifestyle behaviors, helping you to actively co-manage your disease and to live the best lives that you can. And uh, we accomplish all of those things through um, the different programs that we provide to you. And you can learn about all of these programs by going to our website at www.mscando.org backslash programs. We have our flagship four-day can-do program that we hold once a year in Denver, Colorado. We also have our one-day jumpstart program that we do about five to six times a year in different parts of the country. We have our two-and-a-half-day take charge program that we do twice a year. And then, of course, we have our monthly webinar series. Uh, so please uh, be sure to visit us on our website to learn about all of those programs. You can also uh, find us on social media. So look for us on Facebook, on Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Pinterest. Uh, like us on Facebook, follow us, and you can learn about all of our upcoming events and programs and also find some fun video clips on YouTube. Um, so be sure to connect with us. And just to go over a few housekeeping issues, uh, we will save about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for questions and answers. Um, because this presentation is being recorded and archived on our website uh, starting tomorrow, uh, we have recorded everyone's telephone lines, or I'm sorry, we have muted everyone's telephone lines. Um, so uh, you won't be able to audibly ask your questions, but you can submit them through the chat feature, which is located on the left bottom of your computer screen. So to submit a question, just type in that small box, um, and uh, you'll be able to chat with our presenters, and we'll answer your questions at the end of the webinar. So before we get started, I'd like to introduce our esteemed presenters for this evening's webinar. You see on your screen here Dr. Peggy Crawford. Dr. Crawford's training and clinical experience as a health psychologist has spanned for more than 20 years and has afforded her the unique opportunity to work with and learn from individuals and families living with multiple sclerosis. She has had the privilege to share in the life stories that define the journey over the course of MS and reflected these stories in pr into presentations, research projects, and publications. The courage that women and men with MS display when facing difficult challenges has been an inspiration in Dr. Crawford's work and in her personal life. As a member of the staff at the MS Center at the Cleveland Clinic, the Candu family, and most recently the Department of Neurology at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center, she has had the opportunity to connect with professionals as well as individuals with MS and their families. These relationships have nourished her passion for working in the field of chronic illness just as time in Maine has nourished her soul. So we'd like to welcome Peggy. Uh, and we also have uh, Jeff Hodgson, our speech language pathologist, or our speech language therapist. Jeff has uh, 17 years' experience as a speech language therapist specializing in swallowing and cognitive communication issues within the adult population. His areas of interest include acquired brain injuries such as TBI and stroke, as well as progressive neurological disorders. He has worked as a specialist both in the UK and New Zealand, as well as across several US states. He is currently employed at St. Mary's Hospital in Grand Junction, Colorado. He looks forward to sharing his knowledge and experience in working with multiple sclerosis across the spectrum of the disease, as well as interacting with the folks who are coping with this frustrating illness across the country. And now I'd, I'm very excited to welcome both Peggy and Jeff to our webinar, and um, I now give it to Dr. Crawford. Thank you, Anne. It's a real pleasure to uh, be with everyone tonight and know that there are people from around the country, and I can tell from the list that there are even some people I know, so that's, that's an extra pleasure. I want to start by talking about why MS symptoms can be so darn challenging, uh, and there are many reasons for this, one of which is that early symptoms and then diagnosis often occur at a time in life when people are making major life decisions about school, about work, about relationships, finances, and this is 
you know, in part because the diagnosis and early symptoms usually occur between age 20 and 40. In addition, many MS symptoms like changes in mood and cognition that we're going to be talking about tonight are invisible, but they still can affect your function, your roles in the family and at work, and your responsibilities. There are many issues related to invisible symptoms, and in part, this is what makes it so difficult for other people in your life to understand and appreciate the impact that symptoms are having for you. It also makes it easier when symptoms are invisible for you and other people to minimize and even ignore the impact of your symptoms. One of the most frustrating things for people with MS is when other people inaccurately attribute your symptoms to your behavior and think of you as lazy or inattentive or just not caring about your MS, which is almost never the case in my experience. MS can also negatively affect a person's self-esteem and body image even when you look the same. And I know many of you have probably had the experience where someone comes up to you and says, oh, but you look so great. And that's kind of like nails on a chalkboard for people with MS. In addition, many MS symptoms overlap, so sorting them out can be difficult, which means getting the proper treatment can be difficult. For example, depression can be the cause of fatigue because fatigue is part of depression, and or it can be the result of being tired and not being able to do things. So when people can't actively participate, they can become depressed. And most people I've noticed can really help to differentiate sort of what came first. Another example is feeling slowed mentally, which many people with MS experience, and Jeff's going to talk more about. This can be the result of MS-related cognitive changes and or it can be related to depression. So you can see how all of this is, can be so confusing for people with MS, people who care about them, and professionals as well. And Jeff, I was hoping that you could um, talk to us some about cognition and the common cognitive changes that people with MS experience. Absolutely. Thank you, Peggy. Um, hello to everyone. I'm, uh, thank you for allowing me to be here this evening. I uh, see there's about 500 people signed up. It would have been quite intimidating to stare at everyone in a lecture hall, so I'm kind of happy to be at my computer right now. But um, I'm going to start by talking about um, some of the cognitive issues that arise in MS. I'm going to start about kind of defining what cognition is. Uh, so according to Merrill Webster, uh, cognition is conscious mental activities, the activities of thinking, understanding, learning, and remembering. Um, in essence, um, cognition is our awareness of reality. It's how we look at the world around us, how we process the world around us, the information coming in, um, how we communicate, meaning how we use and, under and our un uh, how we use and understand language. Um, and as a speech pathologist, this is quite close to my profession because communication does give voice to our thoughts. It's how we're able to express the inner workings of our mind. Um, when we talk about cognition, and often when cognition is being assessed or delineated, there's many different uh, domains. The most common domains that um, doctors, therapists, psychologists may be looking at are attention and concentration, memory, uh, problem solving, judgment and evaluation, reasoning, language, visual spatial skills and kind of math, computation, and calculations. Now, when you talk about attention and concentration, um, that can be broke up into a few different little subcategories. But basically, we're talking about the ability to stay focused, to stay on task. Um, we talk about sustained attention, being able to sustain your focus in the moment or on the task you're doing. Divided attention, being able to go between uh, either when you're listening to different stimuli, you're listening to the TV and s listening to somebody else in the room at the same time, um, or selective attention, being able to tune out certain things and maintain your focus on another task. Um, memory, we'll go, I'll go into a little bit more, but we're talking short-term memory, which 
also comprises kind of immediate and working memory, um, and long-term recall. Now, long-term memory very frequently, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, is, is relatively spared, um, is not a typical complaint in multiple sclerosis. Um, what we often see is more issues with kind of short-term day-to-day memory. Um, problem solving, judgment, evaluation, um, kind of the decision-making skills, how we reason our way through a problem. Often these can be, are labeled under the umbrella term of executive functioning, which is kind of the, the control centers of our thinking, um, the parts of our brain that make judgments, that analyze what we're doing, that keep us on task, and then make, adjust, and then make those subtle adjustments if we're um, starting to go off task or make errors or kind of things. When we catch ourselves in the moment, that's kind of our executive function, our judgment coming in. Um, language, and basically, is just speaking, listening, reading, and writing. Um, visual spatial skills. Uh, we're talking about analyzing and understanding the space and the world around us. And that's in, two and, in 2D and 3D, so whether it's with pen and paper or out in the world when we're negotiating objects, driving, um, kind of hand-eye coordination, and this will include such things as mental imagery and navigation and depth perception. And then, as I said before, kind of numeric reasoning or, or calculation abilities, math, and this may come up. Some people may notice, um, and this is a common complaint in my experience, is um, people struggling, kind of doing numbers, paying the bills, um, handling money. And you know, to have a selective impairment with, with math and, and money is relatively rare. It tends to also really, much, uh, really get tied into kind of attention and concentration and just being able to get the brain focused on um, doing those um, calculations. Um, now, when we talk about cognitive impairments with multiple sclerosis, the, the research will provide variable reports throughout the population, but typically the numbers are somewhere between 40 and 70 percent, or half to two-thirds of people suffering with multiple sclerosis may experience some level of cognitive change. Now, Typically, and most often, this will be in the mild to moderate range of difficulties. Um, it is very rare um, to develop what we would call severe cognitive deficits. They're less common, I believe, in the range of less than 10% of people would, um, yeah, where things would progress to what we would consider being severe. So um, the vast majority of people are in that mild to kind of more moderate range. Um, these impairments can occur intermittently intermittently as flare-ups, kind of just like other um, struggles with, with MS can occur. Um, they can kind of be transient, come and go to a certain extent. Um, in the latter stages of the disease is when th you might notice um, difficulties that are just not um, getting better on their own or not coming and going quite the same way. Um, now, cognitive impairments in MS are associated with reduced function. Um, and understandably, cognitive impairments often have negative impact on a person's personal life, occupational, and social functioning, um, as well as qual quality of life, which is just their, um, their personal assessment of how fulfilling their life is. And, and that's understanding, understandable. Um, when you are suffering with certain impairments and it's hard to interact with people or to maintain your usual um, level of functioning, it's very easy to become withdrawn, um, to not engage in the same social voc um, or employment activities um, that you were able to enjoy when, uh, um, when, when things were going better. And going along with that, um, it's been found that people with multiple sclerosis who have cognitive impairments, as opposed to those who are just coping with purely physical impairments, um, it's been found they're more like, um, less likely to be employed, engage, uh, engaging in fewer social and vocational activities, um, may notice great, greater difficulties carrying out household tasks, and as um, Peggy 
has commented on and will be commenting on, um, this does play, it does make you more vulnerable to psychiatric illness and depression. Um, and as I was saying, and you can see how it, when you are struggling to interact with the world as you used to do, it is going to create struggles in the workplace and in the household. And this is where people start withdrawing a little bit from society at times. And what we're going to talk about later is how to try to counteract that a little bit and how to stay more engaged. Um, okay. So while I went over the aspects of cognition earlier that we often, um, in general, the ones we most often see affected in MS, um, the most common impairments are mild to moderate short-term and working memory difficulties, um, sustained attention, uh, information processing speed, that slide should read, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, uh, verbal fluency. Now, verbal fluency, and I did see this come up on the list of questions that were, that were submitted ahead of time. Um, verbal fluency. Um, Basically, the definition is the rate at which someone can speak words. So this is a very common uh, cognitive domain that's looked at, uh, that is looked at on cognitive assessments. Um, what that implies is whether or not semantic memory has been affected. And our semantic memory is our memory for meaning, how we subscribe meaning to things. So when somebody thinks of a word, um, that word is activated in the memory centers of our brain, but it activates other related words or concepts. You think of the word table, you imagine a dining room or a living room, you picture chairs, you picture people eating, you picture, and that's kind of how that develops. Um, when semantic memory starts to be affected, um, people do struggle to link words together. It affects how quickly they are speaking um, and a able to formulate those thoughts and those sentences as uh, fluidly as they used to. Um, and then when I discussed visual spatial perception previously, the same thing, how we're finding our way around a space, hand-eye coordination, kind of navigating. Um, um, what's not on that list is kind of intellect and knowledge. Now, pay, um, in the article that accompanies um, this presentation, Peggy made the great point that um, general intellect and knowledge is not something that's typically affected with MS. Um, who we are, what we know, and what we've learned through our life, that tends to stay relatively well preserved. Um, accessing that information is what can be a little bit more affected. Um, and then following verbal fluency, oh, I did skip over conceptual reasoning. That's kind of abstract reasoning, thinking outside the box in a pressure situation. Can you think outside the box to, to, um, to solve that problem? Um, this can be difficult in a, in a chaotic social environment um, when there's a lot of stimuli coming in, and this will fit in with kind of information processing too, which I'll talk about some more. Um, just a flesh out memory a little bit. So basically, I mentioned working in immediate memory, short-term memory is most commonly the, the, um, the domain, um, the type of memory that people may notice getting affected. And memory, in essence, is learning and acquiring and retrieving new information, both immediately and over time. Um, so in, just in real general terms, you know, being able to recall names, remembering your appointments, remembering your medication times remembering things you've read, heard, or seen. Um, now, information processing in the literature is something that's listed as being a common complaint or impairment uh, with MS. And usually along in referencing our speed of processing. Now, information processing is kind of how the brain gathers, manipulates, stores, and retrieves information. It's basically how our brain functions as a computer, you know, how it processes the information coming in and what it does with it. Um, speed of processing is how quickly we do that. Um, and people may have noticed this. Uh, speed of processing can be affected. That can lead to difficulty comprehending information that is coming quickly or from different directions. 
people often complain. It takes longer to come up with an answer. Um, and they may struggle with completing tasks in a timely or an efficient manner, um, particularly in the workplace or school or at home. Um, and this is often a uh, what people notice in kind of a high stimulation environment. It's, it's much easier to concentrate and, and complete a task in a quiet library, but you walk into a, a Walmart or a cafeteria or the shopping mall where there's a lot of things going on. And that's when people can start struggling a little bit with um, keeping track of what they're doing and what they're supposed to be doing. Okay, so some other cognitive difficulties that are often reported or observed in multiple sclerosis, um, problems with balance and coordination, uh, poor concentration, as I mentioned, problems with executive function, the abstract thinking, judgment, and reasoning, uh, drowsiness, uh, fatigue is often a big uh, impedance to uh, cognitive functioning. Drowsiness can lead to complaints of fuzzy thinking or decreased mental acuity, um, just not feeling there, not feeling present or in the moment. Um, we often hear complaints of decreased motivation and initiation, just a, a, sometimes a general apathy, just, and this will probably tie into some of the, the mood issues that, that Peggy will and has discussed, and problems with planning and organization. Um, so finally, as I wrap up this section, um, I just want to make the point that many of these changes that may be noticed in cognitive functioning may be, could, may be a symptom of depression. And I think um, this is a good time to come back to Peggy. Um, cause maybe, Peggy, you can let us know what's important for people with MS to know about depression. Sure. Thanks, Jeff. I want to say that, in general, when people have MS, they are at greater risk for emotional distress of all sorts. And this includes anxiety, um, irritability, moodiness, and moodiness is probably the one thing we often hear from family members and children about, that their parent with MS is moody. And uh, I want to talk specifically tonight about depression because it's, it's much more common for people with MS. And I will talk about major depression and, and give you the symptoms of that in just a minute. But also, bipolar disorder is more common in people with MS, about at least three times more common than the general population. When we look at major depression in people with MS, over a lifetime, if you have MS, 50% of you will experience an episode of major depression. So this is a significant issue and one that we really want to address for those of you with MS. And often people want to know, well, what's the cause of depression in MS? And actually, it probably has multiple causes. While stress and just knowing that you have MS and the impact that it has can result in depression, so you can have an emotional reaction um, and be depressed. We also know that what's going on in your neurologic si system and your immune system, since MS is an autoimmune condition, all can contribute to depression. In addition, sometimes medication affects mood, and steroids is probably the most well-known medication that impacts mood. One of the difficulties is that symptoms of depression can be confused with other symptoms of MS, and this complicates the diagnosis and sometimes pe keeps people uh, depressed for years before they're diagnosed and, and offered treatment. If you think about how fatigue overlaps, cognitive overlaps, and also we know that depression can interfere with cognitive function. So there are lots of good reasons to look at depression. I want to share with you the symptoms of a major depressive episode. And this is different than normal grieving, which can come and go as you have changes with your MS. But grieving is not a feeling of sadness. It's not usually sustained. In order to um, be diagnosed with major depression, 
you either have to have a depressed mood or diminished pleasure in normally enjoyed activities every day for at least two weeks. So this is over a long period of time. Now, for people with MS, often a large component of what's going on with their mood is irritability, moodiness, mood swings. It does not mean that because the mood fluctuates quickly that all of these people with mood swings have bipolar disorders. That's why assessment is so important. But along with the mood and diminished pleasure, often people feel worse about themselves. Um, They maybe feel agitated, but I would say more frequently slowed down physically and mentally with depression. Often people who are depressed talk about how difficult it is to make decisions even about what to wear, what to put on, whether to go out, whether to stay home, and also to concentrate. So again, as I'm going through this list, you can see how symptoms overlap with cognitive and um, symptoms and fatigue. There can be an increase or a decrease in appetite, weight, sleep, although in general uh, what I see is that people tend to have disrupted sleep. So depressed people can often feel pretty tired and fall asleep easily, but they have difficulty staying asleep until they really want to get up in the morning. So they wake early and can't get back to sleep. There's often a loss of energy, again, overlapping with MS fatigue, and a diminished interest in being sexually active. And one of the most concerning symptoms of major depression is recurrent thoughts of death that can sometimes result in people thinking about uh, suicide, which is always something we want to be asking about and concerned about and something that needs to be, uh, people need to talk about if in fact you're experiencing that. Why is it so important to talk about depression? There are actually lots of reasons. Um, First of all, depression just interferes with all kinds of activities. So people who are depressed tend not to be as physically active, We just talked about how it interferes with um, mental, cognitive activities, and also, as Jeff was mentioning, with cognition difficulties. When people are depressed, they really don't want to go out. They really don't want to engage with people. It It negatively affects communication because people, when they're depressed, communicate less to kind of withdraw, spend more time by themselves, and this affects relationships, um, particularly with family members, loved ones. And as I mentioned, depression is often associated with disrupted sleep that can contribute significantly to daytime fatigue. It can be associated depression with difficulty following through with treatment recommendations. So when people are depressed, maybe they're not taking their disease-modifying medication or treatment on a regular basis. Maybe they're not taking their other, maybe they're on medication for blood pressure or thyroid. They just tend not to be consistent. They don't follow through with exercise. So whatever the treatment recommendation is, they may not follow through. It lowers quality of life, as does cognitive impairment, for not just the person with depression, but for the people around them. And what's important to know is that depression is one of the most treatable symptoms for people with MS. And I'm going to be talking about what to do about your depression uh, in just a bit. Jeff, I was wondering if you could make some recommendations to people listening about what to do if they have concerns about their cognitive functioning. Yes, absolutely. Um, Now, if you or your loved one or your family member or friend or somebody you're involved with is concerned, Uh, for potentially developing or noticing some cognitive changes and or depression or mood changes, you know, the first step would be to talk to your doctor or your, or your neurologist, your, your, your primary health care provider. Um, the the reason to go to a doctor first, you know, there are many medical and physical factors that they, that can affect cognition, fatigue issues, uh, medications, um, and things that should be ruled out as well. Um, our neurologists um, at the hospital I'm working at now often will and it may prescribe a 
uh, imaging, like a, a volumetric MRI, which is a type of MRI that assesses the size of the brain structures, uh, particularly the hippocampus, which is the memory structures of the brain. Um, and they can make some, um, some uh, diagnoses based on changes to the size of the structures on whether or not it's um, indicating a likely cognitive impairment, a, a change of the brain that would lead to that. Um, depending what tests or what, what factors your, your physician rolls out, um, they can make several referrals from there, um, possibly to a psychiatrist. Um, it would probably be beneficial, depending on what the issues are, to, to assess between cognitive changes versus depression or, or mood changes that could be causing the symptoms somebody is noticing. Um, a neuropsychologist is a psychologist that um, provides much, probably quite in-depth uh, cognitive assessment, looking at all aspects of well, the basic cognitive domains we went over earlier, as well as a lot of their assessments are um, uh, sensitive to emotional and behavioral factors as well. And they can usually come up with quite comprehensive reports and, and uh, can really pick apart some of the issues. Um, additionally, a speech-language pathologist or therapist like myself, um, you know, we are focused in our assessment and our angle at this is kind of focused around communication and cognition, how the cognition is affecting, um, kind of like I said, how we put, how we use our language, um, memory for communication, um, and then as well as an occupational therapist. Uh, occupational therapists are, are quite specialized in looking at cognitive difficulties within um, activities of daily living. We use the term ADLs in the medical setting, um, which are, um, you know, getting dressed, grooming, toileting, showering, um, running the kitchen, uh, driving. Uh, occupational therapists often are involved in driving evaluations when somebody feels like or somebody points out to them that uh, driving is becoming affected, albeit through maybe visual changes or changes in reflexes or, or uh, timing. Um, um, it's definitely something that's very important to get looked at if we are having changes. And our physicians here will often refer to a, an occupational therapist, which do quite thorough assessments for driving. Um, so depending on how you get um, the process of that, starting with your doctor, um, getting the referral to the proper professional. Um, now, when we talk about, now I want to start getting into what we do to help things. This is the bit more of the um, the positive <laughs> side of the discussion after going through all the things that might be going wrong. It's what we can do to help. Uh, now, cognitive rehab, uh, whether it's with a neuropsychologist, a speech therapist, an occupational therapist, the focus is usually a, along two domains. Um, we may talk about rehabilitation or remediation versus compensation. In essence, Remediation is the, the retraining of the brain, trying to improve brain function, while compensation is learning how to cope with certain changes, compensate for them, and improve your day-to-day -day functioning. Um, now, when we, now, when we are talking about retraining the brain, um, this really does operate under the, the science or the principles of neuroplasticity. Now, this may be a new concept uh, to some people. Um, if you've ever seen a Lumosity commercial on television, it, you, you'll hear it quite frequently, and it's kind of hard to escape those commercials these days. But um, the consensus among scientists um, and neurologists used to be that the brain was stable um, or pretty static after childhood, uh, meaning once the brain had developed, um, the structures did not change. Basically, what you see is what you get. Um, so what you start with as a young person is what you're going to have uh, through the majority of your adulthood. Um, but over the last few decades, um, research is demonstrating the plasticity of the brain, meaning that neural pathways and synapses can change and develop in response to learning experience as well as to injury. Um, so this is the good news. I saw a comment in the, in the chat box over there saying this is depressing. Um, 
and I understand when we're just talking about all the things that can go wrong, it, it, it is it can be um, disheartening a little bit. But the good news is that we can do something about this. That uh, positive changes can be affected, whether it is through retraining or compensation. Um, but we do know that the brain, it, in theory, it's possible that the brain can change in response to training, learning, and experience. And this has been demonstrated particularly after brain injuries, which is when a lot of this is studied. When a part of the brain is damaged, can other parts of the brain take over for it, or can new pathways be formed uh, to go around the part of the brain that has suffered a, a stroke, a blood clot, or a, or a, or a demyelinating lesion? Um, so they are, no, they are starting to find that even into our elder years, the brain structures, to a certain extent, can possibly be remapped and new cortical pathways can be developed to take over for damaged areas. Um, so this is promising for multiple sclerosis, where discrete lesions in the brain affecting certain brain functions, cognitive functions, can be, in theory, rerouted or detoured around. Or other parts of the brain can hopefully start compensating for that. Um, most of the research in um, and I know most people are pretty savvy and get on, uh, do their own research and look and Google many of these issues. A lot of the um, studies on cognitive rehabilitation uh, typically look at cognitive rehab following a stroke or brain injury, a TBI, which stands for traumatic brain injury. Um, there is not a lot of research specifically into cognitive rehabilitation with MS. But there is some, um, but there has been some emerging studies that are coming out. In 2012, in the Journal of Neurology, uh, there was a study looking at um, specifically with MS um, using what's called this modified story memory technique in retraining or in, in ter uh, improving memory function. Um, this is a very um, this is a very specific program that took place over um, two sessions a week over five weeks where I, I don't have the whole protocol, but it involved working on memory by basically learn, um, forming images and stories to help you remember certain words and ideas. And by training specifically on this technique, not only did they find um, well, they found greater brain activation on functional MRI scans, showing that the memory centers of the brain were being activated to a much higher extent in the people in the study, um, as well as the patients in the study reported improved daily function, improved satisfaction, and contentment. Um, so that was very nice. There was, there's very few specific studies looking at cognitive rehab in MS, but this one was, and it did show um, in essence, a certain amount of neuroplasticity, uh, backing it up in terms of the brain function did improve. Um, now, it doesn't mean just this specific technique is what people need, uh, need to improve. There's going to be more research going into it. But what it does tell us is that constant cognitive stimulation, bombardment of the brain, um, can show improvement. So brain training. Um, like I said, I mentioned Lumosity already, but brain training, brain games, um, doing cognitively challenging activities. Um, these activities are operating under the principles of neuroplasticity. Um, it was interesting to me. I, I had the honor um, of being able to observe at one of the four-day Kendu MS programs this last winter, and I heard quite a debate going on amongst the participants on whether or not Lumosity was worth a darn. Um, there was a couple of folks that really felt like they were having a benefit to their attention and concentration and memory by doing this kind of brain training, brain games daily, and other people that felt, rightly so, that by doing this you're just training your brain to the activity you're doing. Um, so that's still a debate that's up, questions, uh, that is up, uh, still a question that is up for debate, sorry. Um, what I think it's important to take away from that is you definitely cannot do any harm by staying mentally engaged every day. Um, I think the, the research we have seen in stroke and brain injury shows that the more 
cognitive stimulation you get, the more mental engagement you get, not just by doing pen and paper tasks, Sudoku puzzles, or Lumosity, but by getting out and about in the world, by working, by engaging with others socially. Um, it helps preserve function, and it helps improve quality of life. Um, so in essence, uh, use it or lose it. We've heard that term before, but when it comes to cognitive function in the brain, it's very, very true. It's generally agreed upon that staying mentally, socially, recreationally, and vocationally active does improve quality of life. It helps maintain cognitive skills, and it decreases depression rates. And whether it's stroke, TBI, Parkinson's disease, or multiple sclerosis, this is very, very true. Okay. So, staying mentally active. You know, in terms of thinking, you know, there's no harm. Read. If you're a reader, read. Read, read, read. Um, puzzles, brain games, learning new games, that's kind of, that's come out of a lot of research um, um, in people experiencing cognitive decline in the later years of life. Uh, learning new things is kind of the key, taking on learning new games, skills, hobbies, physically staying active, exercising, walking, playing sports, yoga has been found to be a great one. Get outside, stay active, uh, stay involved in the community, social activities, whether it's your church, uh, the Rotary Kiwanis, your local rec center, a gym, um, whatever you can do to stay socially active. And then, of course, the creative domains, any, um, music, drawing, painting, writing, singing, um, activating the artistic parts of your brain. Um, you can only help yourself. There's not going to be any harm in staying as mentally engaged as possible. Um, so to go along with, from the beginning, the... the the retraining, the, the rehabilitation of the brain is the compensation side of things. Um, compensation is about developing skills and techniques to help you cope with these cognitive changes or difficulties. Um, one of the main things to work on is to become more organized. Um, I used the words low tech on this slide. Um, at the end of this presentation, there will be a few slides that are going to list some top rated um, apps apps uh, for your computer, your smartphone, or your iPad that, uh, f um, that promote both brain training, exercise, think kind of Lumosity, as well as apps that assist with organization. Um, this list of apps will be included in a PDF file that's going to be sent to everybody participating in this, and I think Anne will mention that later. Um, but just in a very kind of low-tech way, you know, using a day planner, keeping a calendar, uh, medication, organiza medication organizers, um, developing planning strategies. Uh, before you're going to take on a new task or an activity, um, plan it out ahead of time. Make a list. Know what you're going to need to take with you, what you're going to do, how long you have to complete each part. Um, Post-it notes, although in my, um, in my experience, Post-it notes sometimes can lead to more chaos. <laughs> that benefit um, depending on how organized you are with using them and making sure that they don't wind up all of your kitchen cabinets and all of your telephone. Um, but along with a day planner, keeping a journal, keeping a daily record of the things you're doing and the things you need to do. Um, the best compensation or strategy for working around a bad memory is to write things down. You can learn a lot of techniques and mnemonic devices and um, fancy little tricks for trying to improve your memory. And they will have some benefit, but writing things down, number one, is going to be the best uh, compensatory strategy. Okay. Um, to go along with that, some more, um, some more tips for improving uh, kind of daily function. You know, arrange the environment where you perform your tasks, whether it's your kitchen, it's your office, or it's your home office. Um, Keep things organized. It's going to be much easier to find things later. Um, always put things back where they belong. Um, make a daily list and refer to it. Uh, combine activities you need to remember with tasks you do daily. So I use the example, like every day take your pills after breakfast. Um, feed the dog um, after you take your pills. or um, 
by developing some sort of procedural memory, this is a memory for routines, it becomes an activity that's just kind of ingrained. And uh, um, not so much, uh, this is just more a more biophysical recommendation, but doing some of your act, uh, outdoor activities during the early morning or the evening when it's cooler um, help you maintain that homeostasis. I know that the heat is a very detrimental factor with MS. Um, Self-talk or talking to yourself as you perform tasks. Um, it has been shown when you're kind of narrating what you're doing or explaining it to yourself, it can be in a quiet way. This is shown to assist with kind of carryover and retention, kind of like the old strategy when you meet somebody, say their name back to them. This is a good strategy for remembering names. Um, listen to your friends and family. Listen to what they're telling you. Use their feedback. Try to incorporate it. Um, try to rest and relax before you're starting a new task. If you're anxious or tired, it's going to make it very hard to take on a new activity. Uh, you want to kind of stack the deck in your favor. Uh, yoga and meditation have been found to be very beneficial. Um, I'm not a physical therapist, or and I, I'm not very good at yoga. But if you look at the literature, um, the relaxation as well as just the, the physical benefits of yoga and meditation do to have a great knock-on uh, benefit into uh, cognition. Um, now, in addition to these strategies, um, I'd like to bring Peggy back. Uh, Peggy, can you, um, from a psychology perspective, can you talk a little bit more about how to cope with these cognitive changes? Sure, Jeff. You know, I think that one of the things that's essential is for people who are concerned about cognitive changes is to educate yourself and others about the cognitive changes that can occur in MS because otherwise, as I said earlier, because these are sort of invisible to people, um, they often attribute them to other things other than uh, real symptoms of your MS. And I think that when people don't understand something, it tends to be more stress and strain, um, and we want to reduce the risk of misinterpretations. There are various ways to educate yourself. You're doing it here tonight. But there are some uh, wonderful publications, books, and we're going to be sending you those resources as well. Sometimes people want to read about it. Sometimes people want to go to a talk. Sometimes people want to just um, get on a website and, and read about it. Um, taking people with you when you go um, for evaluations or appointments can also be a way for a third party, a healthcare professional, to educate people instead of you always being the person in the middle and trying to do all the education of both yourself and your family. But I think education is power. I would also encourage people to be open to professional assessments of their cognitive functions because these can really help to identify deficits or areas where you are having difficulty, but also your strengths. And then a, a healthcare professional that does this can help you identify compensatory strategies that would be beneficial to, to you and might be able to work with you for some follow-up. Um, but I think, um, first of all, getting the right diagnosis and really knowing um, if you're having cognitive difficulties that you would not expect to have at your age. Also, I encourage people to make safety a priority. I know that often people with MS and family members have a difference or an a disagreement about whether people are driving um, safely because of not paying attention or not being able to stay within the lines or driving too close to other people um, or not seeing um, somebody potentially step off the sidewalk. Um, so I think um, I would wholeheartedly support the idea of a driving evaluation which is objective and can provide a lot of information, including recommendation for uh, driving uh, rehab. Also, I encourage people to think of the compensatory strategies that Jeff was just describing also as tools for improved stress management. So if you think about um, being more organized, having memory aids, those are things that many, many people do who don't have MS because they're trying to reduce stress. And reducing stress is also helpful um, for people's ability to concentrate and um, have 
healthy cognitive, cognitive functioning. I encourage people to think about the benefits of getting help for their cognitive difficulties because the, this will help you be in a better mood and you'll have less stress and frustration and this ultimately helps relationships. A few additional uh, recommendations. I encourage people to explain to others what assistance you need and be specific. It's also good to tell people what you don't need. Um, but if you're, if you're the person in the family who pays the bills and having the TV on and the kids doing their homework in the same room is distracting, then be clear with people that you need quiet when you're paying the bills or choose to do that when other people are out of the house. But it's also okay to tell people what you don't need. For example, if you're having trouble getting your words out, people have a tendency to jump in, to rush you, to say, is it this, is it this, is it this? I think you can say to people, you know, give me a chance. I want to come up with the word myself when possible. So it, it works both ways. And you want to become a creature of habit, develop routines for yourself. As you come into the house, always put your keys in the same place, your wallet, your purse, your glasses, and try to create those habits. Also, it helps to tape, um, record visits um, to any healthcare professionals that you're going to see. Certainly, if you go and see a neuropsychologist and they go over results, which can be pretty detailed, it helps to have another set of ears there listening, which also means there's another person who can help generate questions. I would encourage you to request that all instructions be put in writing so that you have something to take home with you. And now with computerized medical records, often you're given something in writing about the recommendations. And also, it takes a lot of courage, but I would ask for psychological support to help you and your family cope with cognitive changes. You know, and since Jeff talked about what you can do um, when you're concerned about your cognition, I want to talk about what helps depression. First of all, nobody's going to get diagnosed or get the treatment they need if they don't talk about it. And depression isn't always the easiest thing to talk about. It's embarrassing, or people assume they should just be able to buck up and um, take a more positive approach or attitude, and they're going to work through their depression. But that doesn't necessarily work with major depression. So you need to tell somebody about your mood changes. You know, it helps if you talk to your neurologist or your um, primary care physician. Some people talk to their gynecologist, but talk to somebody to get the ball rolling. It can help to see a specialist who has experience with depression, but I would also encourage you to try to find somebody that has experience with chronic illness. Um, psychiatrists are physicians who specialize in the diagnosis and treatment of emotional problems like depression and bipolar, and they're often the people who would prescribe medication. Um, if that's not practical, um, nurse practitioners also can, um, who have specialized training in mental health issues, uh, can prescribe medication. And then finding a good psychotherapist, a psychologist, social worker, counselor who can see you, but often it's beneficial to go with family members as well because that helps work on the relationships and it gives another person um, who often carries weight with family members um, to give their opinion and recommendations. And it may be something that you've been trying to do for years, but they'll listen to somebody else. Um, often people say, well, how do I find somebody who knows about MS or knows about chronic illness? I think you can start with wherever you get your care for your MS, but in addition, there are state psychological organizations and local organizations, um, and they know there who um, has had experience working with other people. And even if they don't have much experience working with MS, if they've worked with other chronic illnesses, often the issues are very similar. So currently the treatment of choice and what is recommended for major depression in MS is psychotherapy, that talking part of the treatment, um, to come up with alternative ways of viewing situations, coping with situations, helping you develop more coping skills, along with antidepressant medication. We have also seen that exercise has an additive benefit um, for people with, who don't meet criteria for major depression, who have mild to moderate depression, sometimes just seeing a therapist 
uh, can be very helpful to pre for depression. Um, people also want to know, well, how do I know what the right antidepressant is? I think that's what um, talking about your symptoms is useful for. Also, people will ask you about your history, and sometimes if people have been on a previous medication that was beneficial, it will be beneficial again. Or knowing your family history and what medications family biological relatives have been on can also be useful and give guidance to the person prescribing. It is important to remember that participation in a support group can be a wonderful thing and very helpful. It is not sufficient for treating a significant depression. And I'm going to turn things back to Anne at this point. Thanks, Peggy. Um, and as um, Jeff had mentioned earlier, um, before we go into the Q&A, here's just a few apps um, that you can find for your, on, on your phone or your iPad um, to do some cognitive and some brain training. Um, and they're listed here on these slides. Um, and we won't go through them one by one right now, but um, these slides will be emailed to you as a PDF where you can find all of these apps and you'll be able to uh, look for them and search them on your phone um, just to kind of uh, play with some different brain training or memory games. And so I do want to thank Peggy and Jeff so much for all of um, the information that you provided today. Um, I know it was a lot of information for our participants. Um, and so we, we did get several questions. And um, I apologize if we can't address all of your questions um, just due to um, our time, uh, but we'll try to get to as many as we can. And so the first question we received um, is about diet. And we actually got quite a few questions about diet through our registration forms um, that were pre-submitted. And so the question is, does the dietary, um, does diet play any role in the correction of mood or cognition or, or, or on your mood or cognition? And is the elimination or adding of any foods helpful to our mood and cognition? You know, I think there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of interest over the years about diet in general in the treatment of MS um, as a whole. Um, but I don't think that there is any evidence that any particular diet or dietary supplement or food either removed from the diet or added to the diet um, has an impact on mood or cognition. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Jeff? Um, no, I'm in agreement. I have yet to see any strong evidence um, that, nutri uh, that certain foods or diets have been beneficial in assisting. Um, yeah, I yeah, have not seen any compelling evidence either way. Great. Okay. Um, and Jeff, this next question is, um, I think would be good for you to answer. Um, we talked a lot about how short-term memory um, can be affected um, with MS, but this, person question, this person's question is, is, is it possible that long-term memory can also be affected by MS? Um, short answer is yes, it's, it is possible. It's just more commonly not as affected as what we see with kind of short-term, more day-to-day -day memory. Um, unfortunately, yes, it is, it, is, it is possible, especially maybe with the progression of the disease, um, but it's not one of the more common complaints or findings we have. But I do know reading some of these comments as we've gone that some people have noticed that. So. Mm -hmm. It, it very much can occur. Sure. Um, and I would assume it also is very, um, it, it depends on also the individual, correct? Yes. And, and what their specific state is. Um, and we have a question for Dr. Crawford. Um, and we did get quite a few questions about this in, um, that were submitted prior to. So the question is, is some, if someone's cognitive issues are becoming worse, does that patient have a chance to develop dementia or Alzheimer's quicker? And so essentially, is there a link between cognitive issues with MS and dementia or, or Alzheimer's? Well, I think to, Alzheimer's is a totally different condition a different cognitive condition than what we're talking about in MS. So cognitive impairment in MS is not something that is Alzheimer's 
or will become Alzheimer's. And dementia um, is a kind of a confusing word because it's kind of a general term, and there are multiple kinds. There are different kinds of dementia. So Alzheimer's is one kind of dementia, but the cognitive difficulties in MS are not Alzheimer's. In very rare and severe cases of cognitive impairment in MS, it could qualify as dementia, but it's extremely rare. Okay, great. Um, thanks for that clarification. Um, and, and then Jeff, a uh, question for you. Um, can you explain how balance and, co and coordination can coincide with cognition? Yes, I think kind of. Jeff, are you there? Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, can you sorry. Hear me? I think we. Yep, I can hear you now. Okay. Um, well, in, from the cognitive um, standpoint, with balance and coordination, often the difficulties we see is um, people's safety um, if they're developing some issues with kind of the distractibility or impulsivity that I mentioned, um, as to go along with some of the physical changes that may be occurring with the MS. Um, People may not be compensating as well for their physical changes and therefore um, moving um, a little bit more unsafely, uh, leading to some balance and coordination issues. Um, if you're fully focused on what you're doing and, you're, and you have some, some leg weakness or some, or some challenges with mobility, um, you're going you're gonna to probably um, be a lot safer than if you're not as aware or paying attention to what you're doing or getting yourself distracted and you're not compensating for some of the, um, the physical issues you're dealing with was um, kind of what I was getting at with that slide. Okay, great. Um, and then Peggy, um, we have a question about depression here. Um, and this person says that uh, they have a lot of uh, major depression symptoms that, that you described earlier, but they've never considered themselves to be depressed. And they always look for positive positions and you know, try to put themselves in social activities three to five times a week, and et cetera. Is it possible to have all of these symptoms and not, but also not be depressed? Well, that's a good question, I, and I think yeah. this kind of maybe comes back to the issue of how overlapping symptoms of, of MS and depression are. Um, and so, you know, if you look at all the, the cognitive symptoms um, that are part of depression and the fatigue and um, that sort of thing, you know, people could sort of say, gosh, I really do have a lot of these symptoms but I think it probably, um, it sounds like this person is already doing a lot of wonderful things that we would recommend as part of the treatment. Um, so it may well be that for them, the symptoms are really more related, not so much to depression, but to MS. Mm -hmm. But to the MS. But I, I think it's unlikely the person is totally missing that they're depressed. But, you know, if they had concerns about that, they could always talk to someone, get evaluated, and maybe that would um, provide some useful information, some feedback. Sure, sure. Um, and uh, to you, Jeff, um, we have a very straightforward question. Where can someone um, get a cognitive assessment done, and, and who, who provides these cognitive assessments? Yes. Um, well, it... it it does depend on what community or town you're in. Obviously, it can be a little bit harder to maybe get the resources if you're in a more rural area. Um, starting usually your local, your physician or your local hospital will have the, um, you, you would want to get a referral from your, from your primary physician, kind of like um, when I talked about the, the first stop is your, is your physician to rule out medical factors that may be causing some of your concerns. But to then get a cognitive assessment, um, finding a referral to um, the psychiatrist, neuropsychologist, speech, or OT therapist. Um, local, so barring you don't have a local, uh, if your, doc, your doctor's failing to come up with any ideas, uh, consulting at your local hospital, um, college campuses, often through the um, well, I don't want to misspeak there. Um, I should ask Peggy, do you, would you recommend? Um, yeah, I mean, I think another way is I was talking about finding psychologists to see 
people for depression or coping, um, certainly organizations, psych psychology organizations, state organizations um, can help people, and often people can go online. So whatever state you're in, if you just type in um, sort of the um, psychology um, organization in Ohio or in Alabama, sort of the state organization, and often they're local, um, depending on the size of the town or city that you're in. Um, but I think another option is if you have a chapter of the National MS Society, they often have lists of all kinds of professionals, and they may be able to point you in that direction. The other thing would be if you have insurance, to call your insurance company, and they can point you to people who could do these assessments as well. That's right. Thank you for that. <laughs> Excellent. Um, we have another question, and I think maybe both of you could um, try to answer this. So um, if one is feeling fuzzy, um, it is very difficult to be mentally and socially active. And, and what suggestions do you have to help that, help for this? Um, oop, I did again. Somebody called me out in the chat box for using ums too many. I was trying to watch myself <laughs> from doing that, and I did it again, darn it. Um, and again, Peggy, you might be a better one for addressing this. I know in some sense there are our physicians will use, there are some medication options for helping with mental acuity. Um, so well, but I, I guess even prior to that, I would say that there are also lots of reasons for people to feel fuzzy, mentally fuzzy, and so to maybe get that sorted out and make sure what really the cause of the mental fuzziness is. And sometimes it's useful even to go through all one's medications with somebody and you know review because sometimes people are on multiple medications and they may some of that may be a side effect of medications and something could be done there. So I, I don't always assume and hopefully people won't that mental fuzziness means it's one more problem that needs one more medication because sometimes it, it isn't. No, absolutely right. Um, you know, and even ruling out other potential medical reasons for fuzziness. Um, I think that's often why um, physicians recommend sort of some blood work um, to make sure blood chemistries are normal and thyroid is normal and that kind of thing. So I think fuzziness like fatigue is one of those symptoms where it's not always straightforward and, and a direct, a straight arrow to what the problem is. So I would, I would look in multiple directions. Great. Jeff, did you have anything to add to that? No, she summed it up quite nicely. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks, Peggy. Um, and then one final question that we had, and um, is there a way to know if the location of the lesions in the brain can correlate to cognitive impairment? Uh, Peggy, do you want to go first? <laughs> Well, I, I think a better job at this might be. <laughs> well, yeah. I think there certainly there certainly is data to support that having lesions in particular areas of the brain, because we know that particular areas do help people do particular functions, and so yes, that does make a difference where the lesions are, um, but also it makes a difference what sort of the total, as they say, lesion load is. So the number of lesions and the, the size of those lesions. So when there's more lesions and more um, size to those lesions, that's definitely correlated with higher risk for cognitive difficulties. Absolutely. We do know, you know, science and textbooks will tell you certain structures of the brain do certain things. The, the third convolution on the frontal lobe controls our speech. The temporal lower lobe of, on the, your dominant side of your brain is, uh, factors into comprehension and memory. But um, in experience, I think we see that it, it often cannot be pinpointed quite so closely. Um, two, ten people with a lesion in the same part of their brain will probably present with ten different issues or maybe nothing at all. Um, right. But getting the full assessment and 
you know, the brain anatomy doesn't always, it just tells a very small part of the, of the story. Sure. Um, and I think we have time for one, one final question. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to um, everyone's questions, but um, I think this is a good one for, for you, Jeff. Um, my ability to formulate ideas and then sentences and then speak are severely uh, impacted and impaired. Can any speech pathologist help with this, or do I need to see a speech pathologist that specializes in MS? Um, I don't think necessarily you need a therapist that... I think you want a speech therapist that specializes in, um, has a neuro focus in adults, um, as opposed to sometimes you'll get referred to a clinic where the therapist may mainly just work with a pediatric or a child caseload. Um, it, it's hard to say. Um, it would be beneficial if you if you have access to a specialist speech therapist, or if they're able to, or if you're able to find out if you have one. And I think even Peggy, is it true through the um, the National MS Society? Do they keep a list of um, therapists and practitioners by region? I thought I'd seen something like that. Yeah, before. they do, and and I think people can call their local chapter or call the 1-800 number for the National MS Society and they should be able to help them. Um, barring to access somebody. to somebody, oh sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was just say barring access to, to somebody depending on where you're living and, and, and who's in your region, um, I think seeking out any speech therapist that does specialize working with adults with, with neurological disorders um, can help and you just want to meet with them and then you can make that decision if they have anything if they have anything that will benefit you or will work for you. Um. I would also encourage people when they're considering going to see any specialist that they um, interview or, or at least come up with a few questions that they, they want to ask before going in for an appointment. I think it's very reasonable for people to find out if the person they're trying to see has any experience with the uh, problems that they want help with and if they've seen people with MS, I think that can make a big difference and um, result in a more successful evaluation and, and treatment process. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so again, thank you, uh, Peggy and Jeff, for, for taking your time to answer all of these questions and for providing us with so much more information about depression and mood and, and our cognition issues. Um, and hopefully, um, you know, we are able to provide enough um, treatment ideas and different tips so, um, you know, everyone can, can work on improving their mood and their cognition. Um, if we weren't able to answer your questions and you do have more questions, then you can certainly um, uh, ask those questions through um, some resources on our website. Um, we have what's called Ask the Can Do Team. It's our online Q&A portal. If you go to our website, um, you can find this Q&A section. You can just submit your question, and your question will be uh, uh, directed towards one of our program's consultants, and we'll be able to answer those questions for you. Um, so please, please go to our website and find out about all these cool resources that we have. Um, and also by registering for this webinar, um, you will now receive monthly um, emails from us about um, our upcoming programs and events. It's called eNews, um, and it's a great way to keep in touch with us and, and keep track of, of any upcoming webinars that are, are coming up and, and um, events that are coming up in your area. And we also have our Can Do Library. Jeff um, had uh, refer to an article that goes along with this um, webinar, and you can find all of those library articles in our Can Do Library on our website on all sorts of different topics. So please remember to check that out, um, and, and you know, feel free to email us if you need anything. And before I uh, share next month's topic, I do want to share with you that we'll be celebrating Can Do Day on September 22nd. Um, our founder, Jimmy Hugo's birthday is on September 22nd, and so we've called it our Can Do Day. Um, so you can join us in celebrating by going to our website and submitting your Can Do Day photo pledge by posting a photo of yourself promising to do something um, and promising to do what you can do on September 22nd and then doing it. Um, it, you can uh, share your photo pledge and get people to like it, and the person who gets the most likes will receive and win a fun prize pack and a $50 gift certificate from Trek Light Gear. So please feel free to check out our website and check out all about Can Do Day and see how you can um, participate in our photo pledge contest. 
Our next month's webinar will be on October 7th. It's with Dr. David Rintel, our program's uh, consultant psychologist, and Lynn Stizzoni, who is a registered nurse. Both are out of Boston. And the topic is navigating the healthcare maze with your healthcare team. Uh, so please remember to join us again at the same time and same, uh, same time um, next month on October 7th. And um, again, I want to thank Jeff and Peggy for joining us tonight. And as a reminder, this uh, webinar was recorded, and it will be available on our website tomorrow to review and to watch uh, with your support partner, with your family members in its entirety. And everyone on this call tonight will receive a copy of our slides uh, from today's webinar, uh, which include all of the apps that were listed, um, as well as there will be a few extra slides on some resources from the National MS Society. Um, so please remember to check your in email inboxes for those. Um, also, when you, uh, at the conclusion of this webinar, you'll be asked to fill out a survey. And if you have just a few seconds, if you can just please complete that survey, it helps us to um, improve on our, on our webinars um, so that they can get better and better each month. Um, so again, we appreciate all of your feedback. We appreciate your participation. And um, Peggy and Jeff, we appreciate your expertise. And so I hope everyone has a great evening tonight.